Uh, thank you, the organizer, for inviting me to speak on the conservation of Fort Ellis. But I don't intend to bore you after lunch with nitty gritties of procedures, compliance, protocols. If you want to learn more, this is my job as a PEM Council member, free promotion. <laughs> These year's awards are all published in the latest Air magazine. Go to the ground floor if you haven't got one, buy a new copy. Now, instead of talking about those boring things, I instead would talk to share three stories with you. The three stories all relate to the same site. It's, it's a story about the design of a new building next to the old heritage building that we have to conserve and how we engage the community in the whole process. The project is in Sarawak on Borneo Island. The site is actually three hours drive away from Kuching Kwe, I practice. Now, a brief history. You know Malaysia, but not many people know about Sarawak. You may know Borneo. Sarawak has a very, very unique history as compared to all the other states in Malaysia. Because we used to be administered by a family, an English family, not an English uh, as a country. And they ruled us for 100 years. We were actually only a British colony for 17 years until the formation of Malaysia. In these 100 years, the Brooks has actually, they had built more than 50 forts that stretch across the state of Sarawak. Fort Ellis is one of the 14 surviving forts that's still standing. So the forts were actually mainly built in timber, except two or three in the capital city. They are, they are very interesting, unique structure, which you don't find anywhere else in the world. Now, a little bit about the fort. The fort, obviously, is a military outpost. But in Sarawak, the fort is more than that. It's a public building. It's an administrative center. It has a court and it has a shipping office. It has everything that the government needs to do to serve a township. And it's always a focus or the focal point for the township development. Chinese would come and build shop houses and trade next to it. And that would also attract attracted Malays to establish villages further away. And this linear settlement pattern is very unique and it's very common in 19th century riverine towns in Sarawak. We were asked to initiate the conservation of the Fort Ellis in, that was built in 1864. For various reasons, it, it didn't happen. <laughs> but in 2005, a few years later, we were asked to design a tidal ball observatory next to it. So why is the tidal ball? It's not an animal. <laughs> it's a natural phenomena where rising tides being funneled through the river mouth and gushing up the river in a series of very spectacular waves. And the government wanted to build a platform for people to watch this. And they wanted to build a lookout tower. But to me, my job then is to convince five politicians in that constituency that it's not the right thing to do. Because with this phenomena, you want to be as close as possible to the water to experience the water coming in, the noise, the anxiety, not up there. And on the other hand, if you do a tower, how many people can you fit up there? Right? So our challenge then is not just to do a facilities. It's actually how to design to respect the ladies up there. I think we had a very obvious solution, which many people would probably just adopt the same. It's just to design a landscape, not a building. See, what the design then hinges on 
was a ram that connects a main rod to a waterfront which is seven meters below. And all the enclosed rooms are programmed underneath a ram or a small car park where all the toilets and services are tucked in. And this was a natural ravine. By doing this scheme, we actually recreated the hill slope, which was actually disturbed a few years ago when the government used it for temporary car parks. And by winding the ramp down, actually is reducing the surface area, that allowing us to leave most of the areas as green. That is the result where on the slope, it's like a stadium terrace sitting, it can, uh, it can accommodate large crowd. This is during Bernard Festival. This become a new home of the yearly festival. That photograph shows Bernard coming in and past the site. The resultant plant form looks like a fern. Edible ferns, very popular among the locals, and also the form kept repeating and reoccurring in the Ibans or Dayat's traditional craft and arts and craft. And that was my presentation to, to entice or to convince all the politicians, five of them, of Dayat origins. That is a kind of reinterpretation of abstractions of your culture. All right? Everybody wanted progressive. I got it past the first time. And I did not design from this. This is what happened, and I made this up. It's salesmanship. <laughs> oh, come on, you don't? <laughs> okay. That is the result. Um, because of the reduced building area, we have too much money for this project. So it's a five million project. It's a very small project, but we've got too much money. We are building a landscape. We are not building a building, right? And by having extra money, we convinced the government for us to spend them all to build a water kind of a retaining wall to protect the slope and also that connects to the existing water fund at the town. I think I'm not going to say much about the design. It's quite straightforward. But what is important and interesting is this sketch that I did. It kind of captured the place. It's about the historical fort, the new facilities, and the tomb of a Chinese pioneer that predates the fort. So that eventually became a significant public space that has got heritage meanings. And it means a lot to the local, and it became a new landmark. Let's take a straw from the existing waterfront, not done by me, <laughs> along the river. As you approach, the, the facility slowly, gradually reveals itself. It alludes to the bunkers in the battlefield. Of course, this is a place where it used to be a military outpost. Yeah? And at night, it turns into a lantern. And to approach, to the upper ram, the roof actually opens up and it turns into garden steps that leads to a courtyard. That allows cross ventilation to the spaces underneath it. And this slide shows that uh, the railing, the details actually was reinterpreted from this range fencing. The brooks used to had a farm, experimental farm, with all sorts of plants, and they also kept animals for milk. You can't ship milk in or import from England at that time, of course. Then, the new and the old building seems to talk to each other, to have a dialogue, through the material used. This is billion. Billion is a wood that you can only find in Borneo. And that is the same timber that was used to build the fort. And if you use a tree, timber we respect, specifically billion, it will last for hundreds of years, never rot. The density is so high where you can't even nail it through. You have to pre-drill it. So we call them ironwood. And in landscape, I took hints from an old Chinese cemetery. Uh, that is um, the last also stay where I pay respect to my great-grandmother. And that's a landscape 
or Fort Ellis, or on the hillside of Fort Ellis. It reminds visitors of the historical tomb and the history and the story of early Chinese settlement. At night, the lighting is very subdued. You can't reimagine really the setting of a traditional Malay kampong with kerosene lamp and torch. Yeah? So that is the place, and that is what we did to connect the story and the memories of the local communities. This is the site. This, this line is actually imaginary lines. So that was the first the scope that I talk about. Now I'm going to talk about this part where the fort stands. When eventually we managed to get to do conservation for adaptive reuse as a local heritage museum, it was like 10 years after the project was initiated. The condition had deter has deteriorated and under this condition, it was really unsafe to enter because you never know which piece of timber is rotting and going to fall next. So we decided that we were going to dis dismantle the whole building. In the process of dismantling, we can learn how the buildings were put together. So in a way, it's a good practice and allows us to record all the details and joineries so that we, do, we can do the right thing. And we were also very, very, very lucky to find a, a photograph that had never been published before. This was lying in the Stonyhurst College Library up north of London. Nobody knew about it. It was by chance it came to us. These photographs were taken by Alexander Hugh Gray, a traveller to Borneo, in 10 years after the fort was built. So it gave the complete setting of the fort then, and it didn't change that much except the river become much wider. So we know that in the old day, you only have more than, not more than a dozen of fort men, and we know where the flat post is supposed to be, that has been moved there now, uh, before, and the trees were still there, all the settings are still there, except we don't know where the toilets and the kitchens are. Now, from there, we kind of reconstructed the whole thing before we move on to the next steps. And from this, we also realised that the fort was not built by the Brooks, it was built by the people under his administrations. It was built by the local and also kind of understanding the local traditions. That's what we found when the timber that we took out was actually very old. That was transported from a previous fort called Fort James. And they were planted in the ground two feet deep, no foundation, no padding. But we have to put in new padding so that uh, you, to keep, make sure that it doesn't settle. And that is a very, very dark tradition of building. They carry long houses with them because they practice shifting cultivations. When lands or your land that you're plowing is getting too far away from where you're staying, you have to move on. Yeah? Then we also, from the archive documents, we realized that a lot of main components were actually prefab in main town and ship down. And then the cladding materials, the smaller components, were actually contributed in lieu of taxes by the locals. And this building was built with our architects or engineers. And there were a series of them being developed at different localities. So we also noticed Malay carpenters' involvement from the kind of roof that it's doing. So that was actually uh, proven from another evidence that we found in, in, in documentation, yeah? So we reconstructed it before we go on site on the computers to test out the sequencing. When we move on site, we map every piece carefully and record them. Then we took it down from top down. And all these Shingles, billion shingles, they are very thin. They are about not more than 12 mm. They are very, very brittle. So the contractors actually use the barge board to do a slide to slide them down one by one so it doesn't break. Then we remove the building down to ground zero. Before we kind of put them back, we stack them systematically, sort them by verifying the species and check out the rot so that we can we can find the same species if they are not billion to replace the rotten part. And this, 
goes on to restore the fort back to its old former glory. But what, that's what it looks like from the road down. It's from the river. And what's interesting is we are not restoring a building to a very pristine situation. It has to be real. It has to have that texture. It has to have that edged. So the worst thing that could have happened is have building that all like that that you present to the government. But the fort was painted in lime wash. Because in 19th century, we don't have modern pen. And oil pen was not introduced to Sarawak until very, very later on, until the turn of century, in 19, uh, I think just second, after the Second World War. And we formed the record, we, we knew that the officers complained about lime wash. There is so much maintenance. But anyway, we managed to put it on, but it's gone through a lot of trial and error. And we even bring the tidal ball up the ramps at night. But what is more challenging is the design or reconstruction of the interior because there is no old photograph of the interior at all. It's only descriptions either on uh, how people work or through novels where visitors <coughs> stay there and write stories. But we have photographs of other forts that show you how the interior could have looked like. And this is the 1950s version of a fort that turns into a courtroom and the same layout, same detail is still used in Sarawak government's court in the districts. And that shows how the officers work, the filing system. And you notice that the building is, has no all air conditions, of course. And then we, we, we do not put air condition in. This design is very, you, it's very clever. The lattices actually fit in between the roof eaves and the, at the seal high and slanting leaning outward, and it's very effective in keeping water out. This also allowed them to shoot down, whereas the arrow and spear is very difficult to penetrate from the bottom up. And that also gave an impression of how they live and what sort of furniture that they use. And there's Vinal Brook, the third Raja, with his subjects. It's very, very casual. And we really created the office's living quarters. Of course, not, nothing, nothing is authentic. It's, it's kind of reinterpretation to give an impression how people live. And we even put in the radio to show that the forts is con being used continuously until mid 20th century. This, this partition area is actually the resident's bedroom. The visitors can have a peep through an opening. The courthouse and the offices uh, there's or officers working sta work station are being restored and these are open to public use. They use it for briefing, for lectures and even the, the gun racks, yeah, where these guns were actually antique pieces collected by the museum and put here. Now, all these are full-scale joineries they being displayed like sculptures that you can open and close and people can play with it so that you understand how buildings are being put together. These panels actually just give a history of how Sri Yaman or the township being developed and also tell them the story of other forts in Sarawak. The conservation process are being documented and displayed in this conservation corner, including artifacts that we found when we did our uh, uh, civil work and they were being restored by archaeologists. At the courtyard level, part of the undercroft are being used to display traditional boards like sampan. And this is the 1930s version of an Iban war board. This board can go as far as 30 meters long. And there are prefab units that can be taken, up, taken apart. And we also restore the Chinese trading board. This trading board is like shoebox apartments. You can fit two adults and two children in there. And this boat plied the river until 1970s. The competitive earth or finish on the ground floor encouraged kids to play traditional games. But what's important is what we've learned. We've rediscovered traditional tools and traditional techniques of how and materials and how to do things in the old days without nails. And how a piece of timber has been packed, it's like you drill a hole, push a dial in, cut a V, take it out, and push it in again, and slice it off. That's how they join. 
and how to work out lime wash to stick on a timber that's very, with very, very, very high density. It doesn't absorb water. So we resorted to all sort of things. Eventually, we used cowhide, that gelatin, to boil it, put in certain percentage so it's like glue. And how this compacted earth was very, very uh, common in China farmhouses. We also reconstructed and found all details and reconstructed lost details like the staircase that actually can be retractable is drawn up at night for security reasons. And the flag poles, when timber is not long enough, how they join it and what sort of a uh, uh, best that they get, all in timber. And we even restored the cannon stand. This is the same detail that we found where Prince William got married. They, they used this to restore the canon that for his wedding ceremony. And conservation can be a sustainable practice. And we show that all the off-cuts, right, are hand chef into dowels and other small components. We use them for, to make furniture sometimes. This, these are the things that use very commonly used by the local craftsmen. If 15 ringgits a piece, you can still buy it in the market. It's very effective. They use it for carving also. And so this thing is the happiest moment in my professional life. We learn so much from them. They also learn a lot from us. But what's important is the sense of pride and they're building their own legacy, getting involved in this job. All these are documented so that it kind of like a handbook that someone else can take this and construct another fort. And it doesn't need me anymore. Now, in the process, we actually uh, conducted a, a community engagement program alongside the projects. I, I usually go for Monday site meeting and finish it before lunch. Then I'll do this with the school children after school. We have support of the MG, uh, NGOs like Heritage Society and PAM. And we work with the first association found in Sri Aman. And we got Lionstar as a sponsor to give us some money and some performance group and museum to support. And we never use any money from the government or from the NGO or the corporate sponsor as CSR. What do we do? We gave talks, we have fun, we sweated under the sun, learning tricks, building things, aspiring to be tall guys. I think that's self-explanatory. I don't have to go further, right? But to be a tall guy, you really need to know your own town, where you live, where you're coming from, your history. So we took them for Heritage Trail. And actually, we found an old steam engine off the rails. Nobody who is coming from a Hawaii. And we speculated that it's from a mine. We actually brought them to test out the local food. And we, we took them shopping, buy food, and go to site, get the workers to show them how to cook in a traditional way in bamboos. For example, rice, chickens, that cooks, those are cooked in bamboo have a feast. When we talk about social, uh, racial harmony, and we have cultural exchange to find out why. We brought them to Malay Kampong and Surau, so they learn, so that they, they can respect what's happening. And we brought them to longhouses, the same thing, and we brought them to a Chinese farmhouse and temples. When the fort is ready, they will come volunteer, go to Royong to prepare at least to meet the public. Before, yeah? Then they were rewarded with a night at the museum. So we pull out to a stretch out a piece of white cloth with two bamboo poles and play the movie A Night in the Museum. Then they have nighttime story and they go to bed. The brothers were actually five and six years old and the parents left them with us. These are the friends of Fort Ellis, they call themselves, and they are future guardians of Fort Ellis. That's what we do. And over 18 months, we have 347 people going through the process, either as a volunteer, helper, visitors, or participants from a core group of 25. And that's what we do. We conserve for future generations. I know I am running over time. I have to be fast because it's 12 years of work to be presented in 20 minutes. But you want to find out more? Bonio is waiting for you. Thank you very much.